On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including the very first five full-color high-resolution images from the James Webb Space Telescope, a European-slash-Japanese satellite takes some quick pics of Mercury, and India helps Singapore enter the space race. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the space race. The first official full-color Full resolution, full spectrum photographic images from NASA's James Webb Space Telescope have been revealed. This is now the deepest infrared imaging of our universe ever recorded. That means we are actually looking backwards in time at a section of the universe as it was nearly 5 billion years ago. We are watching entire galaxies collide and merge together. We can look inside the death and the birth of stars. This gets pretty wild. Image number one, deep field. Thousands of galaxies, including the faintest objects ever observed in the infrared, have appeared in the Webb's view for the first time. This single slice of the universe covers a patch of sky that would be approximately the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length by someone on the ground. This entire kaleidoscope of galaxies that we are looking at all exists in just one single speck of the night sky. This deep field image, taken by Webb's Near Infrared Camera, or NearCam, is a composite made from several images captured at different wavelengths, totaling 12 and a half hours of imaging, achieving depths at infrared wavelengths beyond the Hubble Space Telescope's deepest fields which would have taken the older telescope weeks to capture. The image shows the galaxy cluster SMACS 0723 as it appeared 4.6 billion years ago, about the same time as the Sun and Earth were forming. The combined mass of this galaxy cluster acts as a gravitational lens, which is when the force of gravity from a cluster of galaxies actually bends light in the same way as an optical glass lens, magnifying much more distant galaxies behind it. Webb's NearCam has brought those distant galaxies into sharp focus. They have tiny, faint structures that have never been seen before. The most faint and red-looking clusters in this picture are actually over 13 billion years old. Researchers will soon begin to learn more about the galaxy's masses, ages, histories, and compositions as Webb continues to seek out the earliest galaxies in the universe. Image number two, exoplanet spectrum analysis. This is actually a chart showing the full spectrum analysis of the atmospheric composition of an exoplanet. What's the big deal? This may not look as exciting, but what this chart is showing us right now is pretty wild. This is evidence that water vapor exists inside the atmosphere of a distant planet. This planet, called WASP-96b, is 1,000 light years away from the Earth. This type of planet is what we refer to as a hot Jupiter, meaning it is a very large, gaseous planet that is orbiting very close to its host star. In this case, the exoplanet is about half the mass of Jupiter, but it is orbiting at a distance much closer than planet Mercury is to our own Sun. This makes the exoplanet very hot, so we know that there couldn't possibly be liquid water in this composition, but we can see water existing in a vaporized form. Astronomers also believe that there is evidence to show clouds and haze of water vapor exist on this planet the same as they do on the Earth. In this case, James Webb is analyzing the spectrum of light that is passing through the atmosphere of the exoplanet as it travels towards us. As light passes through a gas, like water vapor, the wavelength of that light is altered in a very specific way. By reading those variations in the wavelengths of the light across multiple spectrums, we can actually see the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Image number three, the death of a star. This is our first close-up image from the James Webb Telescope. We are looking at a nebular that has been created by a dying star that is expelling its mass in giant heaves of superheated material. We can see a kind of foamy-looking orange structure around the edge, 
This is molecular hydrogen expelled by the star. The inner blue haze area is actually hot ionized gas that is being superheated by the leftover core of the star. Image number four, Stefan's Quintet. This is an image of a cluster of five galaxies that are about 300 million light years away from us. This quintet is locked into a cosmic dance by immense gravitational forces. We can actually see two of the five galaxies in the process of actively merging together. Over the course of billions of years, these two will continue to spin closer together until they become one singular new cloud of stars. This is the interaction that drives the growth of galaxies across the universe. The superheated gas and dust in the area of the collision is actively creating new stars and planets. Image number five, Stellar Nursery. The final image is of the Carina Nebula. This is one of those cosmic birthplaces of stars, a kind of stellar nursery. This cloud is actually within our own Milky Way galaxy at a distance of about 7,600 light years away. There are thousands of new stars being formed out of this nebula, and hundreds of them have never been seen before. The Hubble Space Telescope took a very famous image of this same nebula, but the level of detail that the James Webb brings now is absolutely unprecedented. By using the infrared spectrum, we can actually see through the clouds of dust and gas that form around these super hot young stars and reveal the details within. This is easily one of the most humbling images ever created. Think about this for a solid minute. Inside that giant cloud is the raw materials for everything that we have ever known, everything that we are, and everything that we will ever be. The team behind the James Webb expects to be publishing findings like this about once a week for at least the next five years. If you wanna to get to Mercury, you need to go fast. So fast that a near pass takes only 15 minutes. On June 23rd, the Bepi Colombo satellite, a joint operation run by the European and Japanese space agencies, made its second pass by the system's closest planet to the sun, skimming just 200 kilometers above the boiling surface, and it snapped some incredible images. The cratered surface of Mercury looks a lot like our moon, and the satellite was able to catch some of the clearest visuals of its surface formations since the messenger probe crashed into the planet back in 2015. Bepi Colombo is also attempting to study Mercury from orbit. This pass is the second of six planned orbits, each one shedding a little bit of momentum, and some using Venus and Earth to nudge the crafts into position to be captured by the orbit of our system's first planet. I say crafts here because Bepi Colombo is actually three platforms. The ESA's Mercury Planet Orbiter, the JAXA's Mercury Magnetosphere Orbiter, or MEO, and the Mercury Transfer Module, which provides propulsion and telemetry for the whole rig. The images taken on the June 23rd pass were actually from the MTM's monitoring cameras, which are meant to keep an eye on the spacecraft. But when a camera catches a planet, NASA doesn't argue. The study of Mercury isn't exactly like our study of other planets. We aren't expecting to find life, for instance. Mercury is way too close to the sun for that, we hope. But we are aiming to explore Mercury's strong magnetic field, its volcanoes, craters, and water. That's right. The hottest planet in our solar system has tons of water ice hidden in the polar craters where the sun never quite reaches. And it's dense too. Despite being only slightly bigger than our moon, Mercury is almost as dense as Earth, leading astronomers to speculate that it formed much bigger and lost the loose outer crust, either to the sun's heat or a tremendous impact but it still remains what must be a massively dense iron core, leading to a magnetic field so strong that even close to the sun, previous missions have detected trace amounts of atmosphere. Mercury is a very odd planet, with a lot to tell us about the formation of the early solar system. It may not have life, and it may never be able to support a crewed mission to its surface, 
But when BepiColombo finally gets into a capture orbit and separates to complete its scientific survey, you can bet we'll learn some things that will serve us well on other planets. The space race is heating up and it seems Singapore isn't going to be left behind. With a little help from its South Asian neighbors, India and South Korea, the country was able to launch three satellites into orbit and start what they hope will be a larger constellation of monitoring satellites to help them with maritime security. The Indian Space Research Organization provided the rocket, a solid-fueled single-core variant of their polar satellite launch vehicle. The Indian organization has been launching satellites into orbit on their own since 1980. And even though this mission was only the second ever to be managed by their commercial counterpart, New Space India Limited, the launch went predictably without a hitch. South Korea's Satrek initiative, meanwhile, was responsible for building two of the satellites, both of which fall within the company's specialty of Earth observation satellites. The DSEO, a high-resolution Earth imaging satellite, meant to support disaster relief efforts and Singapore's national security apparatus, and the NUSAR, Singapore's first radar observation satellite, capable of gathering images in day or night, regardless of cloud cover. The Singaporean National Space Office says it's hoping NUSAR will be just the first of six satellites in their first constellation. The final satellite, SCOOB-1, was made by Singapore Nanyang Technological University, and the shoebox-sized CubeSat will be making observations of the sun. After depositing those three satellites into orbit for the client, the fourth stage of the PSLV rocket then turned to its secondary mission and activated the six smaller Indian payloads that will be conducting experiments using some solar arrays that were attached to generate electricity for this phase. As routine as these satellite and research launches are becoming, we are starting to see a broader and broader range of countries and commercial entities getting into various space industries. Every experiment adding to humanity's knowledge base and every satellite adding to the picture of Earth. India's PSLV rocket has made over 55 launches since its introduction in 1993, but this was New Space India's second mission. And Singapore, a relative newcomer to space, doesn't have a launch apparatus of its own. By getting some help from their neighbors, Singapore is now able to join in on the push into our solar system. So, welcome to the space race, folks. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.